The Bible is an ancient canon of monotheistic documents, or is it? Many scholars believe that what we have today is the product of later editing and changes. Originally, the most ancient biblical authors were polytheistic, and later strict monotheists redacted and changed the oldest documents to sound more monotheistic. Is this true? Is biblical history a later product of monotheists hiding a polytheistic past? Despite the Bible as we have it today being a clear monotheistic canon, many scholars believe it is the work of scribes who wanted to hide a polytheistic past in Israel and pretend their history was a relationship with just one God and their ancestors. An argument to support this view that is often made is from the archaeological finds. We don't find a lot of evidence of strict monotheism in ancient Israel or in the surrounding nations. Instead, what we find is evidence of rampant polytheism and Yahweh possibly being incorporated into a pantheon and given a goddess as a wife. If all we had was the archaeological record, we would have very little evidence to suggest monotheism existed in ancient Canaan. However, we need to remember what we're asking here. The question is not if Israel was polytheistic. The question is whether or not the biblical authors and certain ancestors were originally polytheistic. If the Bible is true and accurate in its representation of the past, we should expect to find rampant polytheism throughout ancient Israel, because that is what the biblical authors report happened from generation to generation. The book of Joshua says Abraham originally worshipped other gods, and when Israel lived in Egypt, they worshipped other gods. While they were wandering, they may have been devoted to Yahweh in name, but even then they chased after other gods. After Joshua died, the book of Judges recounts that over several generations, the Israelites worshipped false gods. Solomon may have constructed the temple, but within his own lifetime, he polluted Israel with idols. Throughout the time of the divided monarchy, any resemblance of strict devotion to Yahweh would be expected to be missing, with the exception of a few kings. The book of 1 Kings even says that at one time, there was only about 7,000 left in Israel who only worshipped Yahweh. The biblical account does align with the archaeological record, as they report the problem of rampant polytheism from generation to generation. So if we ever excavate the Temple Mount thoroughly and find evidence of polytheism, that would be expected if biblical history is true. The real question is, does the biblical account accurately report the story of a small cult that preached devotion to only one God, that only managed to get power and influence at random times in Israel's history? Because that is the biblical account. Not the idea there was this faithful nation that always hated pagan idol worship and never abandoned the covenant with their God. That history doesn't exist anywhere, as Michael Heiser says. There was a good deal of theological diversity, including polytheism, among Israelites living hither and yon in the deserts, hill country, coastal plains, etc., but not with respect to the biblical writers. So we really should not be asking if Israel was always strictly monotheistic, but if the biblical authors were, and if they accurately represented the past of there being ancient monotheistic tendencies in Israel who handed down their teachings to us. But when it comes to the biblical texts, many scholars still ask if the theological views of early authors were changed by later authors. So first, we need to define what we mean by monotheism, because this is a fairly new term. No one in the ancient world called themselves a monotheist or a polytheist. And what we mean by monotheist may not be what the ancient authors meant. The colloquial understanding of the word monotheism is the belief there is only one God. But when we start to look for cultures or writers who fit into this mold, we realize there is a great amount of diversity. For example, Jens André Herbener 
notes there are several types of monotheism. There is philosophical monotheism, which is the theology of a small elite, usually tolerant of the people's worship of many gods. It is characterized by the notion of a supreme god of whom all the other gods are merely aspects. There is inclusive monotheism, implying that a divine unity is hidden behind a diversity of gods. There is ethical monotheism, which is supposed to be a characteristic of the biblical Jewish concept of the divine, and which is particularly characterized by the notion that God is just and by requiring a moral way of life. Jan Osman notes there is evolutionary monotheism and there is revolutionary monotheism. This form of monotheism manifests itself in the first place as a negative or counter-religion, defining what God is not and how God should not be worshipped. And on top of this, there are many other forms of monotheism. So to keep things simple for the sake of this video, we'll use Herbener's definition of monotheism, which is the belief in one true God and the implicit or explicit exclusion of other gods as non-existent, demons, or the like. In other words, the use of the category of monotheism should be restricted to religions and elements of religions characterized by a belief in the existence of solely one God. Now notice this broad definition doesn't exclude the existence of other spiritual beings that could be considered gods or divine beings by other cultures. It doesn't exclude the idea of showing reverence to other spiritual beings as well. This is important to remember going forward. Next, another problem is that when we look at the biblical texts and other ancient texts, there is really no equivalent word in Hebrew for God. What we translate as God is the word Elohim, and that seems to have a broader definition than what our English word God means. Michael Heiser points out the term Elohim refers to Yahweh, but it is also used to refer to divine beings on God's heavenly council, the gods of other nations, demons, the spirit of dead Samuel, and the figure known as the angel of Yahweh. Now no one denies there was ancestral cult worship in Israel, and even the biblical authors suggest this. But there is no evidence the biblical authors thought the dead spirit of Samuel was a god, or a being one should worship. The same is clear for demons or foreign gods. The biblical authors suggest these are real spiritual entities, but that doesn't mean one should worship them or that they are the true god, as we define this English word. Also, many times in the biblical texts, there are references to a divine council and its members. It was a common belief in the ancient Near East to think of the gods in the heavens on a divine council presiding over the cosmos. And the biblical authors were no different in their belief and make references to a heavenly council. However, the difference is, for the biblical authors, they did not teach that power and knowledge was shared among different members, like in polytheistic councils. The implication in the biblical text is Yahweh is sovereign over all, and the council members are just there to carry out God's will and assist however they can. So for the biblical authors, divine council members could be Elohim, but they should not be worshipped like Yahweh. So it seems in the Bible, the word Elohim just meant any being that lived in the spiritual realm. Yahweh was an Elohim, but not all Elohim were Yahweh. Or equal to him. In reality, the divine name is the closest thing we have that best fits what modern people say when they hear the English word God. Because Elohim seems to refer to just a spiritual being, a demon, an angel, a dead person, or something else. Technically speaking, there is really no ancient generic word to distinguish between the Creator God and what we refer to as demons or angels. Ancient cultures lumped all these beings together under one or two terms. Samuel Meyer notes, Supernatural messengers in the ancient Near Eastern cultures typically are identified by the lexical item in that language also used to identify human messengers or subordinates sent on missions. There is therefore no specially reserved term to distinguish a class of such gods 
from other gods on the one hand and from human messengers on the other. So when we say there is only one God, an ancient Yahwist might agree if we explain what we mean by the term God. We mean there is only one eternal, omnipotent creator. Yet, we might agree with the ancient Yahwist that there are multiple Elohim, once we understand what they mean by that term. So like polytheism, monotheism can posit multiple divine beings and can even allow someone to display reverence to multiple spiritual beings. But monotheists also say that people should only worship one of these divine beings, specifically the Creator. Michael Fried in his study of ancient Greek religions notes that there are too many ambiguities between polytheism and monotheism. Both typically posit a high Creator God and lesser divine beings that were created and exist in the spiritual realm. A monotheist, like a strict Catholic, could venerate and ask for intercessory prayer from another spiritual being. But that doesn't mean they are actually polytheistic, because they only worship the one Creator God. But that sounds like another view that is contrasted here, called monolatry, which is defined to mean the acknowledgement of other gods, or spiritual beings, but the exclusive worship of only one God. A lighter form of this is called henotheism, which typically means the temporary elevation of one deity as the only god one should worship within a polytheistic setting. So now, if we understand the Bible acknowledges there are other Elohim, just created spiritual beings that can be real entities behind these foreign idols, then the biblical authors seem to be more about preaching monolatry theologically while thinking of monotheism in ontological terms. In other words, because the word Elohim doesn't equate perfectly with our English word for God, we can see where the confusion comes in. Theologically, the Bible preaches monolatry, only worship one Elohim, who is Yahweh. But in their theological statements, there is implicit monotheism, as we understand it, that there is only one eternal creator, even though there are other divine beings that were worshipped by other people. So in reality, when we think of what the biblical authors are claiming, it is better understood in terms of monolatry, since we have to use their words and definitions, especially when it comes to the term Elohim. Sure, we could say they are monotheists, but in reality, they were more focused on preaching monolatry. So from this point on, when I refer to biblical monotheism, I mean theological monolatry, with implicit ontological monotheism. So please try to keep that in mind. Now some object to this, because there are times we read phrases like, there are no gods beside me, neither shall there be after me. These statements have been used to argue for an evolution to monotheism, since at some places in the biblical text, it refers to multiple Elohim. But these other passages might imply there are no other Elohim. Well, in reality, these verses fit well with the idea of there being multiple Elohim, just not equal to Yahweh. First, the use of multiple Elohim on the Divine Council doesn't go away when monotheism was supposed to emerge. It is still present in Jewish works that are considered by most scholars to be late. Also, Michael Heiser has gone through the Dead Sea Scrolls and has found numerous references to Divine Council theology. The Hebrew term for assembly and council appear unambiguously in references to a heavenly assembly. The phrase for divine assembly occurs six times. Between the main phrase and the variations, there are seven instances of assembly of the Elohim. Council of the Elohim occurs three times. The phrase all the Elohim is found 18 times, and the host of the Elohim occurs twice. Heiser says, by way of summary, there are nearly 180 instances of explicit divine plurality in the sectarian Qumran scrolls, a number far greater than in the Hebrew Bible. Many of these instances are found in unequivocal divine council contexts of the type associated with the allegedly polytheistic stage of the religion of biblical Israel. These gods are found in the heavenly temple heights praising God and serving Him. Angels are seldom found in these contexts. The data therefore portray a theological situation quite contrary to what would be expected if Jewish theological thinking 
was moving away from polytheistic belief towards an intolerant monotheism. No one doubts the Essenes, the sect that gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls, were monotheistic. If there was an evolution away from polytheism, why are the phrases of multiple Elohim still in use in this very late material? Perhaps the late and early material both understand Divine Council references doesn't imply polytheism. Now Mark Smith is aware of this fact, and argues that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the fully-fledged deities were reduced to mere heavenly powers by this point in time. But I fail to see an explicit indication of this. The language in the early and late material is similar enough to posit the theology could have been the same in the older periods. It makes more sense to say biblical authors believed in the existence of multiple Elohim, but Yahweh was sovereign and above all other Elohim, just like modern Christians believe when it comes to God and his angels. Even Mark Smith has to acknowledge references to a divine council doesn't mean the writer is necessarily polytheistic. Next, statements where we read there are no Elohim beside me also fit with divine council theology and the existence of multiple Elohim. These verses were not an attempt to hide ancient polytheism, and one doesn't need to look far for an analogy. In Isaiah 47, we read that Babylon proclaims, There is no one besides me. This can hardly be understood as a claim that there were no other cities. The phrase only indicates that Babylon is declaring itself to lack an equal, and that no city is as great as it. Likewise, when Yahweh says there are no Elohim beside him, it only indicates his uniqueness with regards to other Elohim. There is no one as great and as powerful as he. Given the immediate context of the Hebrew Bible, these verses can hardly be attempts to claim there were no other Elohim, just that no other Elohim was like that of Yahweh. Now Mark Smith mentions several verses that could indicate polytheism, but most of them never indicate there was another Elohim equal to Yahweh or that Yahweh was beneath another Elohim. They can all be understood in terms of monotheistic divine council theology, like what we've already gone over. There are, however, two passages that some scholars rely heavily on to indicate ancient polytheism is hidden in the Bible. First, let's take a second to recognize the gravity of this. In the entirety of the Hebrew Bible, there are only two passages that are primarily used that could indicate ancient polytheism. This should raise at least the thought this could just be quote mining and circular reasoning. Honestly, if the best they can do is rely mainly on two passages, I have to admit that's not very impressive. The first passage that is often brought up is Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 9, which reads, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of El, but Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted heritage. So some scholars suggest this passage indicates the Most High, the god El, a lot of the various nations to lesser gods, to be ruled over, and when it came to Israel, El gave Yahweh this nation. And this indicates ancient Israel used to think El and Yahweh were two different gods, and Yahweh was subordinate to El. Furthermore, the grammar of this passage indicates the text is possibly ancient, and there are parallels to this idea in Ugritic inscriptions, where El gives to other gods nations to rule over, such as Egypt. Now the name El does show up in the Bible. In some places we read of El Elyon, meaning El Most High. But when we read of El, the authors indicate this is just another name for Yahweh. Carol Vandertorn lists several comparisons from the biblical text, speaking of Yahweh, to other ancient works that speak of El. And both are called Most High and the Creator. El is called Father of Years, which is comparable to Yahweh being called the Ancient of Days. El at time presides over a council, as does Yahweh. El is said to be compassionate, Yahweh is merciful and gracious. Both are described as shining, and both are referred to as the Holy One. Both are called Father, a healing god, appear in dreams, set amid cosmic waters, and are given the residency of a tent. It is often argued that originally Yahweh 
was much more like El than like Baal. In the patriarchal narratives of Genesis, El names such as El Olam and El Elyon are frequently used as epithets of Yahweh. Various scholars have drawn the conclusion that El and Yahweh were identified at a rather early stage. This identification is sometimes explained by assuming that Yahweh is originally an El figure. Minder Dijkstra wrote extensively on the origin of the name Yahweh, and given the data, it most likely originally was just another name of El. He says, this revival of El's names and epithets in the exilic and post-exilic theological vocabulary is only explicable in the light of the tenuous, never broken tradition that El Yahweh in the end is and was identical with the patriarchal El, the God of Israel. Mark Smith holds to the evolutionary theory and argues that by the 8th century in Israel, Yahweh was given the female consort Asherah. The biblical authors condemn such practices as forsaking their ancient covenant. But Asherah was traditionally El's consort at Ugarit. So such an act would only make sense if there was a cultural idea that El and Yahweh were the same deity. So as far as the biblical authors were concerned, El Elyon was just another name for Yahweh. This would make sense with the name Israel. If El allotted Yahweh the people of Jacob, why was the nation not called Israel? Yah, being their national deity was Yahweh. But if Yahweh was just another name for El, this would make far more sense. Israel worshipped El, who was Yahweh. The case can also be made as well by looking at the text of Deuteronomy 32. First, the text doesn't say El allotted to Yahweh. It just says the Most High divided the nations. Elion is just a title applied to many deities. It is applied to Yahweh in the biblical text, but at Ugarit, it is the title given to Baal. And interestingly enough, it is never applied there to El, the father of the gods. Since Elion is probably just a title meaning Most High, it could just have been a title referring to Yahweh in Deuteronomy 32. Otto Eichfeld notes the language does not explicitly claim there is a distinction between Yahweh and the Most High. The author of the song, it is true when speaking of Yahweh's relationship to his people, avoids probably intentionally the application of the hitherto used active verbal form, and so does not say directly that Elion gave Israel or Jacob to Yahweh as his portion, but is content to establish the fact that Israel has become the property of Yahweh. So the passage could just equally mean Yahweh, who is the Most High, gave up the nations to lesser deities and then created a people for himself. Even if the text did say El Elyon, that would not explicitly mean Yahweh was thought of as a different deity, since there are many other passages where they are identified as the same. To say they were originally seen as two separate deities is to presuppose the conclusion you're looking for. An explicit distinction may have been the case in different cultures, but that doesn't mean it was the case for the biblical authors. In fact, Mark Smith agrees. Despite possible appearances to the contrary, the composer did not intend any picture of polytheism with his rendering of verses 8 to 9. In fact, he likely thought of El and Elyon simply as two of Yahweh's titles, as they are elsewhere in the Bible, and not as a separate god El, the implied reference to the multiple divine sons likely did not bother the composer of the poem. In the wake of the identification of Elion as a title of Yahweh, the divine sons are only implied in the text at best. It was probably easy for the composer to pay little or no attention to this matter, as this was a standard trope of divinity that the composer had inherited. Thus the passage shows something of an older worldview of translatability of the national gods, even as it ultimately rejects it. To see why, let's look at the internal context in the surrounding context of other biblical texts. Jonas Greenfield draws attention to the prior verses, where Yahweh is identified as Father, Creator, Wise, and has lived for the years of many generations. At Ugarit, these motifs and language are said of El, El is said to be the father and creator of mankind, as well as wise and the father of years. The language comes on the whole from the description of El. The people are called witless, that is lacking the basic characteristic of El. 
The first and third verbs, create and establish, are used of L. Eternity, ages past, is a well-known word pair, but both words are epithets of L. Verse 8, which mentions the Most High and the sons of Adam, presents on the one hand another epithet of L, and on the other reminds us that L was called Father of Man. The author of Deuteronomy 32 has skillfully woven into his covenant poem these and other elements of antecedent literary traditions. Thus, Deuteronomy 32 applies the same language to Yahweh, implying the authors assume they were one and the same. Now, some object to this by noting that in this passage, Yahweh is only said to be the father and creator of Israel, not all of mankind. Other lesser deities were said to be the fathers of their nations as well. However, this objection misses the point. The passage does just say Yahweh is the father of Israel here, but it is not just that title that scholars like Greenfield, Heiser, and Van der Torn draw on. It is the fact that the same motifs and language used of El is applied as a whole to Yahweh. If in this passage Yahweh was just called the father of Israel, no one would try to make the connections. But because several existing motifs of El are applied to Yahweh in Deuteronomy 32, it seems the authors already understood Yahweh was El. As for the passage only referencing Yahweh being the father of Israel, that would be expected because that is what the passage is about, not all of mankind. And despite that, the motifs are still there. Also, one of the biggest reasons I don't think Deuteronomy 32 implies Yahweh is a subordinate of El is we need to take a step back and look at the larger picture in two ways. First, let's remember where this text came from. In the much later Masoretic text, it doesn't read sons of El, but sons of Israel. Some scholars suggest this is a later attempt to hide polytheism by changing El to Israel. However, the reason we know it was not originally the sons of Israel is because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which came from an obviously monotheistic sect. If it is monotheists that copied and preserved this passage in question, we should be skeptical this passage was meant to imply polytheism. As for the Masoretic change, I'm not actually convinced this was an attempt to hide a polytheistic past. I think the change could reflect later Talmudic commentary that the Jews were meant to inherit the whole earth and the Gentiles would become their slaves. The change would be consistent with this idea because it would assume God had already divided the world up according to the 70 of Jacob who went down to Egypt so it doesn't necessarily refer to an attempt by the Masoretic scribes to hide polytheism. Also, several other passages within the biblical canon correlate to this monotheistic interpretation of Deuteronomy 32. Psalm 29, which is considered to be early by many scholars, says Yahweh is enthroned forever over the flood. The text also begins with plural imperatives, indicating a divine counsel is at play. In the ancient Near East, the flood was thought to be over the dome that covered the earth. And if Yahweh is said to reign there, then he was already seen as ruler over all the nations that were beneath the flood. Psalm 24 is also considered by many to be an early psalm that refers to Yahweh as ruling over the world and is at the head of the divine council. The point being by bringing up these two psalms, is to know there might be early evidence existing alongside Deuteronomy 32 that Yahweh was seen as already ruling the world, not just ruling Israel as an inheritance from El Elyon. Plus, there is Numbers 23, another early poem attributed to Balaam, that also seems to equate El and Yahweh. Next, Nathan MacDonald notes a theme of Deuteronomy is how Yahweh chose or elected Israel. This would fit more with the interpretation that Yahweh the Most High gave other nations to lesser deities, but then elected Israel for himself instead of being given Israel. Also, a later text incorporated into Deuteronomy is chapter 4, which parallels Deuteronomy 32 and says it was Yahweh who allotted the nations to other Elohim and kept Israel for himself. In other later texts, like Isaiah 10:13 has Yahweh in control of the boundaries of the nations. These are often dismissed as coming from a later monotheistic time period. But as we mentioned, 
The language and grammar shows that some of these passages are early as well, and provides surrounding context to better explain the theology of Deuteronomy 32. Plus, internally speaking, Deuteronomy 32 can function just fine as monotheistic, as the Essenes probably thought. So the larger context seems to fit more with this monotheistic understanding, as does the internal evidence. If the only reply after this is brought up is monotheism was a late development, so there has to be evidence of early polytheism, then you're just assuming the conclusion you want and not letting the evidence speak for itself. Some try to argue that later in Deuteronomy 32, Yahweh is seen as an accuser, and this would signify he is not the most high. In Zechariah 3, Yahweh is judge, and a lesser being acts as a Satan, meaning accuser in Hebrew. Well, it is true Yahweh acts as an accuser of Israel, but in verses 19 to 29, he also acts as judge, which was the role of the one who presides over the council. Verse 19 notes that Yahweh sees the crime, and then what follows is he passes judgment. Yahweh will make them jealous, provoke them to anger, and bring about all sorts of disasters. There is not a shift to another deity above Yahweh. In Zechariah 3, Yahweh passes judgment through the angel of the Lord, who is also said to be Yahweh. So Yahweh taking on two roles in Deuteronomy 32 would not be an issue for the biblical text. This is then followed by Yahweh implying he is the Most High, because there are none beside him, and he has the power over life and death, and then there is another claim that Yahweh is at the head of the Divine Council, and that the gods should bow down to him. This seems to be pretty clear language, that Yahweh was already seen as El within the poem itself. Again, Mark Smith agrees. More specifically, the original composer understood El Elyon as a title for Yahweh, despite drawing on the old polytheistic type element. The author intended no polytheism, and perhaps knew none in this case. In other words, the biblical authors may be referencing an old polytheistic idea of El dividing the nations, but they still understand this as if El was just another name for Yahweh, and interpreted this within their own monotheistic framework. And there is no issue in acknowledging they reference this old idea. After all, the biblical authors readily admit they descended from polytheists. But that doesn't mean biblical theology evolved from polytheism, since this is consistent with the biblical account of a sudden change due to divine revelation. This would be similar to what Paul does in Acts 17, taking old polytheistic poems from Greek writers and applying them to Yahweh. Taking something from a polytheist and reinterpreting it doesn't necessarily mean biblical theology evolved. The last objection is in verse 9, where the conjunction could indicate a contrast. In other words, the use of the word should be understood as a shift from the Most High to Yahweh, who receives his inheritance. Well, this is possible, but unlikely given the immediate context we already went over. The passage can equally just refer to the Most High dividing the rebellious nations up and then creating a people of his own. Ultimately, the cultural context can be helpful in shedding light on a particular passage, but it should never be used to trump the immediate context of the passage in question. And when it comes to the biblical text, the immediate context overwhelmingly implies Yahweh was understood as another name for El not a lesser deity under El. The other passage that is brought up is Psalm 82, a psalm of someone named Azaph, which reads, God has taken his place in the council of El. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. So scholars like Mark Smith and Simon Parker 
draw on the verbs for to stand and to judge. In the ancient divine council setting, the judge would sit, whereas the members of the council would stand. If Yahweh is standing, he is not at the head of the council, but just a member among many other Elohim. Also, the verb for the word to judge can also mean to charge or accuse. As we noted earlier, being the accuser is often the job of a lesser being, not the judge residing over the council. So it appears Yahweh is just an accuser standing before the council of the Most High. However, like with Deuteronomy 32, this seems to be quote mining. At the end of the psalm, it is Yahweh who pronounces judgment. There is no indication of a shift in speaker, despite the claim by some that the author silently switched from Yahweh to El, speaking in verse 6. There is no hint that this is what is happening. Also, generic terminology is used like Elohim and Elion. Considering the author is just using titles, we have to acknowledge there is no explicit mention of a separation of Yahweh and El, just like it is with the rest of scripture. The terms could just as easily be understood to be referring to Yahweh, who was the Elion Most High. Because of this, it is far more parsimonious to understand Psalm 82 as giving Yahweh the role of accuser and judge, and this makes sense with the context. The other Elohim have failed to do their jobs properly and cannot be trusted with divine roles. Yahweh thus takes on the roles of judge and accuser, since there is no other Elohim who can properly perform such tasks. As Kirsten Nielsen said, It would appear from our brief survey of recent research, as well as the textual analyses we have here performed, that it is characteristic of the prophetic lawsuit that Yahweh enjoys the dual role of prosecutor and judge. That Yahweh appears as prosecutor can be explained by the fact that it is he who has been wronged. So it makes sense for Yahweh to stand and accuse in the beginning. None of the other Elohim have carried out their roles properly, so none of them can be trusted, and Yahweh takes on the role of accuser and judge to add insult to injury. Some object that the Hebrew phrase in the midst refers to Yahweh being equal to other Elohim. Being in the midst of others implies an idea of equal power, but this is not the case elsewhere. For example, Numbers 14.14 14 says Yahweh is in the midst of his people, and that obviously doesn't mean Yahweh is equal to humans. Next, this interpretation of the passage would correlate to other places where Yahweh takes on two roles. Throughout the biblical text, Yahweh tends to act through a co-region, seen as an extension of himself, and at times is also referred to as Yahweh. In Zechariah 3, Yahweh acts as judge, but also is a mouthpiece for the judge as a separate figure known as the Angel of Yahweh. This would be similar to Psalm 82, where Yahweh takes on two roles. Trigve Medinger notes in the biblical text, the name of Yahweh was seen as an independent yet extension of Yahweh himself. And there are other passages where we see an extension of Yahweh acting as a co-regent with Yahweh who sent him. So given the context of the Hebrew scriptures, that is all this probably taking place in this brief Psalm. Yahweh is taking on two roles by an extension of himself. As Michael Heiser says, the burden of proof falls to Smith, Parker, and other scholars to detect any expression in the Hebrew Bible that demonstrates Yahweh lacked jurisdiction over any part of the earth at any time in Israelite religion. Also, what is so inconceivable about the idea of ancient monolatry or monotheistic ideas? Why does this have to be a late development in Israel and therefore all the clearly monotheistic ideas must be dated to later periods. This is something I have never understood. It is not like the ancient Near East was devoid of monolatry or henotheistic tendencies. A text from the old Babylonian Empire reads, Lord Nana, who is greater than you? With whom can you be compared? A Neo-Assyrian text reads, Whoever comes after me, trust in the god Nebu, trust no other god. In Egypt, one of the Hyksos kings was said to worship no other god but Seth, and the Hyksos were originally from Canaan. Jan Asman highlights Egyptian wisdom literature 
as being quite henotheistic, with only focusing on the Creator being the only God that matters when it comes to the idea that all the other gods in life were dependent on the Creator God Ra. Then of course, we cannot forget the heretic king Akhenaten, who attempted to impose monotheism on Egypt. After his demise, monotheistic tendencies remained in different texts, referencing ideas that all the gods were just different aspects of one supreme god. Osman says, In Egypt, this concept of a supreme being comprising in his essence, the whole pantheon, goes back to the Ramazide period, and seems to be a reaction to Akhenaten's monotheistic revolution. It stresses the oneness of God while retaining the multiplicity of the divine. In the last instance, all gods are but one, the imminent manifold manifestation and diversification of a hidden and transcendent unity. So why is it so inconceivable that there was an ancient Amorite named Abram from the Middle Bronze Age who had monolatrist ideas about his personal god Yahweh, who he identified with the high god El Elyon, which was then forgotten by his descendants and later revived under someone named Moses? Why is this so inconceivable in the existence of monolatry with monotheistic tendencies in the ancient Near East so unfathomable? Thus, given all this data, the claim that biblical texts were originally polytheistic should be rejected. Until we have external evidence, there is no reason to posit this idea. When it comes to the Hebrew Bible, we are dealing with a monotheistic canon. The debate should be about when these documents were written. Were some put together early and the rest accurately reflect the past? Or were they all written late and reflect late religious ideas? But the claim that the biblical texts were edited later to remove ancient polytheism is based on very limited data. The few passages brought up by skeptics make far more sense within their own context, the Hebrew Bible. 